All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is our second lecture on the Industrial Revolution. This one is called Economic Innovations. We're actually going to combine this with our titans of industry as well. So this is kind of, um, usually I do this as two lectures, but they're still both pretty short. So I'm going to combine them in, into one and try to move through them pretty quickly. Um, if you don't remember, the Industrial Revolution is what we started in our last lecture. We, we looked at this revolution, obviously, that started to occur, not a political revolution, like the American or the French Revolution, but a revolution of the day-to-day -day life of people. Instead of people living on farms, now they're living in the cities. Instead of doing cottage industries at home, now they're going to factories in order to work. We're seeing that there's a rise in uh, the population. There's a rise in the living standards. There's um, more people have more access to more food. And all of those seem like great things, but in our later lectures, we'll be looking at some of the more negative in impacts of the Industrial Revolution. Revolution. And I want to remind you that here are our three essential questions. The first one is, why did the Industrial Revolution begin in Britain? We already saw uh, those reasons. We saw they had access to coal. We saw they had freer political institutions. We saw the financial backing that was there as well. And we've already talked about some of the political, social, and economic, and environmental impacts. Today, we're really going to be focused on the economic impacts because we'll be looking at the rise of capitalism. Number two is, what was the role of government in industrialization and how did Western governments differ from non-Western governments? We're going to be looking at Western governments and laissez-faire economics and non-Western governments who get heavily involved in industrialization and we'll be able to compare and contrast them. And three, what were the pu push and pull factors causing massive migration? What were the responses to this influx of immigrants? We're not going to look at that as much today, but we'll look at that in subsequent lectures. We should be able to explain and how capitalism and laissez-faire economics took hold in industrialized nations, and we should be able to compare the government's role in industrialization in Western and non-Western societies. I'm also going to add in there that we should be able to identify the major titans of industry, or what I'm going to refer to as the new elites. So we'll be talking about the new elites, we'll be talking about the changes to the social structure as well, we'll talk about the good things they did, and then a later lecture we'll talk about maybe some of the bad things that they did as well. Let's go ahead and move on in our lecture here to Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations. Before we get into this, let's remind ourselves of what the dominant economic theory was at the time. The dominant economic theory was mercantilism, the idea that colonies exist in order to benefit the mother country. For example, the United States is there to benefit Britain. That idea, that economic ideal, I guess, requires the government to be heavily involved, which means the government has to pass a whole lot of rules. And if you remember, the people of the United States, well, I guess before it was the United States, the people of the British colonies could only sell the goods to Britain. They could only get, if they were going to export cotton, they couldn't export it to France, they couldn't export it to Spain, they had to export it to Britain. Then they could only buy their goods, like textiles, from Britain. So they couldn't buy it from France or Spain or anywhere else, had to buy it from Britain. Well, that's a lot of rules. What we're going to see here is a different type of economics that starts to get rid of some of those rules. Let's start with our author. Our author is Adam Smith. He's a Scottish um, idealist and a, sorry, a, a Scottish philosopher in some ways. He writes a lot about philosophy, but he's most famous for his book, The Wealth of Nations, which is an economics book. He describes a laissez-faire approach to economics. Laissez-faire is a French term that means hands off. He's saying the government should keep their hands off. The government shouldn't make a whole lot of rules. The government should just kind of stand over to the side and not do a lot, not necessarily do nothing, we're going to see later that the government needs to do something, but they should not get heavily involved. This is the economic idea of capitalism, that government should stay out of business and let the businesses do whatever they need to do. We call this the free market, the free market because it's free of government control. That's what we mean by that. His idea or his book um, illustrates this using the invisible hand. The invisible hand is this unseen force of supply and demand, and that's what improves the economy, not government assistance. Let me give you an example to kind of tie all of this together. Let's imagine that my classroom 
um, has, let's say, 30 people in it. I'll pretend to be the government and everyone else in the class will be their own business. Now, there may be students who come into class and they have no shoes on, we'll say. You know, most students have shoes, but for this purpose, we'll kind of put that to the side. People don't have any shoes and they really, really want shoes. There might be a student in this in that class who says, well, wait a second, I'm really good at making shoes. I'm going to make shoes and I'm going to sell the shoes to these other kids because they demand shoes. Now, what I want you to see here is that I, the teacher, did not tell that kid to make shoes. I didn't say, hey, you better start making shoes because people need them. What he saw was that people were demanding shoes and he supplied the shoes. The invisible hand came in and that is what forced him to make shoes, the supply and demand. And that's going to raise the economy, not anything the government does. Now, let's say everyone has shoes now, but it's getting a little colder outside. So people really demand coats. What that student's going to do is say, hmm, I can't make shoes anymore. Now I'm going to switch over and start making coats because that's what people demand. Once again, the government doesn't tell him. I didn't go and tell him and say, hey, you should start making coats now. No, he just started doing it because he saw a demand and he supplied that demand. Once again, the invisible hand came in, uh, came in and improved the economy. So the government should just stay out. I'll also give you another example of when the government being involved uh, creates a negative impact. Now, when I was in college, Obama was in office and President Obama came up with his, his health care plan in which he was going to have people you know, enroll in health care. Everyone was going to um, have, have some sort of health care. And so my friend was working at Jimmy John's and he was working about 40 to 50 hours a week delivering sandwiches to people. Well, when that new law uh, under Obamacare, uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, came into play, the rule was that if you worked 30 hours a week or more, your company had to pay for your health care. Well, the owner of Jimmy John's didn't want to do that. He didn't want to pay for people's health care because that was going to cut into his profits. It was going to make it more difficult for him to open up stores and pay people um, and make sure that, you know, yeah, he could pay all of, him, all of his employees. So what he did is that he limited everyone's job to 29 hours per week. So now my friend, instead of working 45 hours a week and making 45 hours worth of money, now he could only work 29 hours a week and therefore only make 29 hours uh, worth, of, worth of money. So that was very, very difficult for him because he did now didn't have as much money and so he couldn't spend as much money and therefore the economy, and if you do that for every single person, the economy is going to go down. Um, so that's an example of government getting involved and messing everything up, which goes against the idea of laissez-faire and the invisible hand approach. Now, I understand that I, I just made fun of President Obama. I'll make fun of President Trump a, a little bit later. Um, the last part here is that this replaces mercantilism as the dominant economic philosophy, um, especially in the West. So we're going to see that the United States and Britain and other Western countries, think like Europe, are going to be the ones who use this laissez-faire, hands-off, invisible hand supply and demand approach to things. Non-Western countries are going to use something different, but we'll talk about that in just a second. Now, when I say that the government stays out of things, I mean that they generally stay out of things, but not always. They're going to get involved in some ways in order to protect those businesses. One of the big ways that the government is going to get involved in Western countries is through the use of a tariff. Let's go back to our example that I said. Remember, we were you know, had the kid, he was selling shoes, then he was selling coats. Okay, so let's go back. Let's say he's selling shoes to the children who don't have any shoes. Well, let's say that next door in the class next to me, there's a student over there who's even better at making shoes. Not only are his shoes more durable, but he can make them for a lower price as well. Well, everyone in my class is going to go over to that other class and they're going to start buying shoes. After all, the shoes cost less and they're even better. That's totally going to mess things up in my classroom. It's completely going to destroy the economy. But what I can do as the government is I can stand at the door to my classroom. And when that student from another class wants to sell shoes in my classroom, I can say, sure, sure, you can sell shoes in my classroom, but you're going to pay me first. You're going to give me 
and say $200. You're going to pay me $200 in order to sell shoes in my classroom. Well, that student may not want to pay $200 in order to do so. And so what will happen is that he, he'll just refuse to pay that and he won't sell shoes in my classroom, which makes it much better for the student that's already in my classroom and selling shoes. Or that student from the other classroom may choose to pay that $200, but then he's going to bring up the price of his shoes. After all, he still needs to make a profit. He needs to make up that $200 somehow, and so he's going to charge his uh, buyers a little bit more money. And since those shoes cost more money, then people aren't going to buy them, and they might buy, they will most likely buy the shoes of the person who's already in my classroom. And so what we see is that tariffs are put into play in order to protect the businesses and give an incentive to people to people to buy domestic. When I say buy domestic, I mean buy things from within the country. The United States is known for doing this, um, especially during this time period, because their companies were just starting off. Without these tariffs, John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, all of the guys we're going to talk about a little bit later are absolutely nothing because Britain would easily be able to undercut them. So the tariffs are there in order to uh, protect domestic industries. The Dingley Tariff of 18, 1897, we don't need to know, know these specifics. All we need to know is that it raised tariffs up to 47%, which was the highest it's ever been during, during times of peace, which very much protected the industries within the United States. We also see that there's many strikes. As we're going to see a little bit later, there's many reasons why the common man is so upset with the Industrial Revolution, um, whether it's because of poor working conditions or low pay or other things. So what these people will do is that they'll form unions and they'll go on strike. That's something that all of us should be pretty familiar with because the teachers union in Clark County goes on strike a lot. And the reason they go on strike is to demand better working conditions or more money or whatever it is. Well, during this time period, especially in the United States, the government's going to step in to put down the strikes. They're going to bring in the militia. They're going to be the ones promoting the business interests. Two strikes that you'll learn about in detail next year in AP U.S. history will be the Homestead Strike and the Pullman Strike, both taking place in the 1890s. Just know that the government is going to step in to help businesses. Otherwise, they're going to let businesses do what they want want to do. There's no minimum wage law. There's no OSHA standards in order to ensure that people are safe. There's none of that because that costs money. That gets in the way of businesses. Um, and you certainly don't want to do that, at least according to the laissez-faire economics as proposed by Adam Smith. Let's go ahead and talk about private corporations in Western society. So we, we're starting to get bigger and more um, transnational corporations. These are large companies that aren't just in one nation, but are in many, many nations. Um, we have a lot of these today, which is, you know, we don't think about transnational corporations because we're so used to transnational corporations like Amazon and Apple and Facebook and Google and all of those other ones that aren't just in the United States, but are worldwide. And so we see these joint stock companies just get bigger. And we talked about joint stock companies earlier. Now they're just getting larger and larger and they continue to get larger and larger. Um, and that's either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your point of view. Another big one was the De Beers Diamonds Company. And we're actually going to discuss this more in Unit 6 when we look at imperialism. This company was uh, run by a British businessman named Cecil Rhodes. Very humble individual. That's a complete joke. He uh, named an entire country after himself. So modern day Zimbabwe was named Rhodesia, you know, because his name was Cecil Rhodes. Humility is really a lost art. So um, this company now operates in Australia and Canada, but it got its start in South Africa by taking out diamonds and then shipping them back to Britain, where they would be sold for a whole lot of money. What we want to see here is that this is a massive company uh, and that makes a whole lot of money for its owners and for its shareholders. But it's also an example of imperialism because it's taking the resources from Africa and using it to benefit the Europeans. And we'll discuss that in more detail when we get to our next unit. Our last one is Unilever, which is this big company that's even still around today um, that produces household goods um, as factories all over the world. It's originally a British and Dutch company. What we need to get from this slide is that these companies are getting bigger and eventually lead to the big, large transnational corporations that we have today that I previously mentioned. 
Let's talk about governments in non-Western countries. So everything I've already mentioned, those are Western countries. The laissez-faire, the hands-off approach, let businesses do whatever they want. That's West. That's United States. That's Britain. That's Europe. Non-Western countries are going to do things a little bit different. First of all, let's start with the Ottoman Empire. During this time period, the Ottoman Empire is the sick man of Europe. Countries and empires can't live forever. That's just the way it is. We've seen many empires fall throughout our study in world history. And the Ottoman Empire has been around since the 1300s, but it's it's kind of its time, uh, time to go. It's near the end of its life. Now, what it, the Ottoman Empire will do is that it will attempt to modernize through the Tanzimat reforms. These reforms are going to attempt to root out any sort of corruption um, and going to provide secular schooling and going to provide millets as well. Millets are um, are these almost these local uh, judicial courts in which people get to um, make decisions for themselves. We don't really need to know about it at least too much not here in world history. What we do need to know is that everyone in the Ottoman Empire is going to hate these hands and mat reforms. The Muslims of the Ottoman Empire are going to hate the secular schooling. After all, they're very traditional Muslims. They want the Muslim education, the Muslim schooling, the secular schooling that's gotten rid of the study of the Quran and focusing more on technology and industrialization. That's going to make them very upset because that's messing with their traditional culture but also the christians of the ottoman empire are sick and tired of being controlled by the ottoman empire now i've talked about this a little bit in the nationalism video and the unification video but i'll talk about this here as well is, is that you have these christians in the ottoman empire who say to themselves wait a second we don't look like the sultan we don't act like the sultan we don't have the same culture we don't even have the same religion as the sultan why is that guy who doesn't look like us act like us have the same religion as why does he make decisions for us we should be our own country we should be our own nation it's a very nationalist idea and something that took hold because of the enlightenment and we talked about that when we looked at the enlightenment we saw that people should at least under the Enlightenment philosophy, organize themselves based on who they are, not based on who their sultan or who their king is. Um, and so you get all of these Christian societies in the Balkans, think like where Greece is today, who want to break away from the Ottoman Empire, which is another reason that the Ottoman Empire is a sick man of Europe, because so many of these societies want to break away from the Ottoman Empire and do their own thing, not be controlled by some sultan or some king or someone who doesn't understand their cultural values. I want you to realize this because nationalism is almost seen as like this dirty word to Today in our modern society that's based solely on racist thinking and nationalism can be very racist I mean we will see that in unit 7 and in, in, in full effect but it's not always racist sometimes people are nationalistic because they feel that they're being controlled by someone who isn't like them who doesn't think like them who doesn't share the same values or the history or, or, or anything else, any other parts of the culture. Um, and so they want to be able to make their own decisions. That's something that all of us can understand. I mean, after all, people like being able to make their own decisions and live their own life and not be told what to do. I mean, you guys are teenagers. You get told what to do by your parents all the time. It's awful. It's really annoying. You want to be able to make your own decisions. It's kind of the same thing, just on a nationwide scale instead of a personal scale. One of those individuals who wants to do their own thing is Muhammad Ali, not the fighter, not the boxer, uh, of, of Egypt. Now, Egypt at this time was still under the control of the Ottoman Empire, but Muhammad Ali has a whole lot of money and a whole lot of power, and he knows the Ottoman Empire is very weak, and so he's going to start to act independently of the Sultan and do his own thing. He's going to modernize the military. He's going to educate people. He's going to be the one to start to take a whole lot of land and a whole lot of power but what he does in response to industrialization is he uses the government to control everything he's going to tax the peasants and he's going to tax the peasants so much that they actually have to give up their land to the government so the government owns the land once he, Muhammad Ali, the government, owns the land, then he's used, going to use it to grow cotton and set up textile factories because his overall goal is to compete with the British. What he's seen is that the British have come into Egypt and they are selling their textiles and it, they're selling it for very, very cheap. 
just like that student from the other classroom sold shoes in my classroom. Very, very, very cheap. And it's undercutting everything. It's absolutely destroying the Egyptian economy. So he's going to attempt to control all of that in order to compete with the British. Ultimately, he's not really going to be that successful with it, but it is an example of a non-Western country um, engaging in industrialization. Generally speaking, and we'll see other examples of this a little bit later, generally speaking, non-Western countries are going to have a heavy government involvement. They're not going to have laissez-faire or free market economics. The government is going to be heavily involved in industrialization in non-Western countries. Let's go ahead and talk about our second part here, which is the second industrial revolution. Now, this particular age, especially in the United States, was called the Gilded Age, and was called so by Mark Twain, and you'll learn about this more when you get to AP US next year. The reason he called it the Gilded Age is because the word gilded means to be covered in gold paint. And what he said was, look, if you're an alien looking at the Industrial Revolution, all you see is gold. Everything is shiny. Everything is new. There's oil. There's steel. There's electricity. There's railroads. There's cheaper goods. All of these things are great. But if you scratch away at that gold paint, you're going to see the dirty substance underneath. Now, what we're going to do in this part of the lecture is we'll look at the gold. We'll look at all the good things. In our next lecture, we'll scratch away at that gold paint and we'll see the dirty surface underneath. We'll really see what's going on with the Industrial Revolution. Let's go ahead and talk about what's the difference between the first and the second. The first Industrial Revolution is what we went over in our last lecture. Big focus on cotton, textile productions. The second Industrial Revolution is the late 1800s to early 1900s. There's a focus on steel, electricity, oil, and the creation of railroads. What we're going to see in the second Industrial Revolution is a change in the social structure. Remember, social structure is how we organize society. Underneath feudalism, we had kings and then nobles, uh, I'm sorry, then lords, then knights, then serfs. Our social structure here with the Industrial Revolution is going to change. Yes, we'll have political leaders and we'll have those old monies, old money people. We call them old elites. But next to those old elites, we're going to have new elites. These new elites are these people here who make their money, not because they've always had money, not because they own land, but because they have businesses. These new elites are people like Rockefeller um, and Carnegie. Um, and for more modern day examples, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, these are people who created businesses and built their way up. And because they have all this money, they have social and political power as well, as evidenced by this political cartoon. I mean, this is supposed to be Congress. I'm sorry, this is supposed to be the Senate where political leaders make decisions. And look, all of these guys right here represent the new elites, the ones who have steel and oil and sugar and all of these other things and how much in power and influence and control they have over the political leaders. Now, the old elites aren't going away. They still have a lot of money in the first place, so that's how they maintain their power. Um, and the second thing is that they also um, can use that money to invest in the new elites. Like, for example, they can invest in steel companies and make even more money. So the old elites are still there. The new elites are ones who are rising up in power. I would also like to point this out here just because I didn't notice this before. But right up here is the people's entrance, and you'll notice it says closed. So the people, the common everyday people like you and me, aren't allowed. They don't have the political power to influence them. Only the monopolists, only this big entryway where these big guys can come through, only they have the, uh, the power to influence politics. And we'll discuss that more when we get to the uh, second part of, uh, or the uh, another, uh, sorry, when we get to a different part of our lecture and we discuss what's underneath all of that gold paint. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the gold here. The first part is railroads. Railroads are great. Love railroads. Uh, I think they're one of the most overlooked parts of history because they play such an important role and they've kind of just gotten ignored because we have better modes of transportation now. But the first public railway uh, in Britain was connected Liverpool to Manchester. This did a lot for uh, the British society. One, 
now people can actually move into the city, which is great. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Secondly, railroads provide jobs. You need builders, you need conductors, you need people to run the whole thing. So and now more people have more jobs and they have more money to spend on more things. And, and the last part here is that improve transportation and decrease costs. The reason that things from Amazon are so cheap is because they can deliver it so quickly. And if, after, after all, in the previous lecture, I said time is money. The less time you spend, the less money it's going to cost. Well, railroads are faster than everything else. And so the, or at least during this time period, so the costs are going to decrease, which makes it much easier for common everyday people like you and me to buy the goods and engage in this consumer culture. Now, this part over here is one of the, one of the best parts. I really like this. This is a brief manifesto in, against trains. So this showed up in, an, um, in a newspaper in Indiana in 1830. And I'll give a quick summary here. What this guy is complaining about, he's, he's worried about trains. He said, like, oh, I can't ride any trains. In fact, no one else should ride trains because if you ride trains, uh, well, that's going to that's, that's gonna anger God, okay? God made human beings to be able to walk and run and maybe ride a horse, and that's it. You can't, you can't ride those trains because they go too fast. You get on that train, and you, if, you, if you ride it, you're, you're going to start freaking out. You're going to start you know, waving your hands above your head. Your brain is going to come out of your ear because it goes at the breakneck speed of... 20 miles an hour, um, That's that was too fast back in 1830. 20 miles an hour, ooh, hey, oh, that, that's too fast, that's too much. You're gonna start freaking out and the whole society's gonna fall apart. People are gonna die and everyone's gonna go crazy. You know, we laugh at that nowadays, but nowadays people sit around and complain about how 5G is going to you know, microchip all of us and we're gonna be controlled by our government. So people have always been afraid of new technologies. That's just the way the world works. Um, here's a map of all these railways in Europe. As you can see, there's many, many railways, especially in Britain, because that's where the Industrial Revolution started. But there's going to be other railways that come into play as well. These railways play an incredibly important part of transporting goods and transporting people. In fact, during this particular time period, this is more true in the United States, but still true in other countries, you could travel more in a day than your grandfather did in an entire lifetime. I mean, think about this. If you were born into a, a city, let's say you were born in London down here, why would you move if you didn't have a railroad? I mean, it would be impossible to do so. You're going to pack up all of your belongings and what? Walk? Ride a donkey? Like, no, there's no way you could do so. And that would be, there would be you know, like social suicide to do so. I mean, you would have to move to another city, meet new people, try to get a new job. And so you're just going to stay in London for the rest of your life. You're never going to go anywhere else. But if you can hop on a railroad, especially if it doesn't cost too much money, you can get to new cities. You can start a new life. This idea of being able to move to another city and start your life and work there is a relatively new idea in the grand scheme of everything. Now, people are starting to be more global citizens rather than local citizens. After all, before the railroads, all you know is just these small city and village around you. Once railroads come into play, now there's this big, gigantic world that's really been opened up to you. I'll go ahead and get off my soapbox. I don't want to talk too much about it. Railroads in the United States include the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, for those of you familiar with Monopoly, b &L Railroad. We'll be talking about Monopolies a little bit later. Um, and the second part here is the Transcontinental Railroad, completed in 1869, um, connecting uh, in Promontory Point, Utah, and thus expanding almost all the way across the United States. You could feasibly go from the East Coast to the West Coast of the United States along one railroad track, which to us doesn't seem like that big of a deal. After all, I can fly across the entire country in what, like four or five hours. But in 1869, this was a huge deal. The idea that you could get from one place in the United States all the way out to the West within a couple of weeks, I mean, that's amazing. You could, I, as I said, move more in one day than your grandfather did in an entire lifetime. Let's talk about the growth of cities in Europe. Now, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, Fewer people are going to be farming, more people are moving into the cities, and here's the proof. Cities like Manchester in 1801 had 35,000 people and now have increased about tenfold to 353,000. That's a huge increase. There's a reason that Manchester has soccer teams like Manchester United. Why? It's because it's a massive city. Why is it a massive city? 
because of the industrial revolution. Fewer people are farming, more people moving into the cities because that's where the factories are, that's where the jobs are, that's where the money is. We also see that generally speaking, the population is going to increase. The worldwide population in 1750 was 140 million people. It almost doubles in 100 years to 266 million people. Now to us, this may not be that that impressive or that amazing but i want to actually re come back to this chart over here to really just express how revolutionary this is this is only 40 years okay you go from having a small very quiet little manchester to 40 years later having this booming metropolis 40 years is like one lifetime like you know people who are 40 years old i mean could you imagine being you know being born in a small city and by the time you're in, in the your middle ages you're in a completely different city like it's, it's just so many more people that's very similar to what we're actually experiencing in las vegas here where we used to be a very small quiet town and now we're this bigger city i mean we have a hockey team and we have a minor league hockey team. We have a football team as well. We're starting to become a big city right before our, our, our very own eyes. And we're doing so very, very quickly. Manchester was even more so. So this truly is revolutionary. I mean, just the speed by which this is ha happening is absolutely amazing. Um, we don't need to really talk about that. Let's go ahead and talk about Cornelius Vanderbilt. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and go over the major titans, or as I am going to refer to them, the new elite. These are individuals who built businesses, who gained a whole lot of money, and because they gained a whole lot of money, now sort of have social and political power, either for better or for worse. Some people call them industrial titans because they made steel and oil and railroads and they made it accessible to everyone. Some people call them robber barons because they created factories that uh, oppressed people and paid them very, very low wages and then also didn't actually care about their health at all. And we'll discuss that robber baron side a little bit more when we get to our next lecture. Right now, I'm going to focus on the good things, the titan side. Let's go ahead and talk about Cornelius Vanderbilt. Now, he's the railroad titan and the namesake for Vanderbilt University. He was known as the Commodore, and he owned New York Central Railroad. And what he did is he took these fragments of all these railroads that had already been built and connected them all together. And then he used the railroads in order to gain a whole lot of money. How much money? This much money. Let me give you the story behind this. Now, if you want to skip this story because it's actually – has no educational value to it. You can. And I'll put where uh, you know, you need to get. You need to come back to um, in the video description. But this is my own picture of the breakers. This is from Rhode Island. Now this is the summer home, so the second home of Cornelius Vanderbilt the third, who is descended obviously from Cornelius Vanderbilt. You can see how big this home is. This home is absolutely massive. Like here's a person for scale. And you can see how ornate and absolutely uh, gorgeous it is. So it costs a whole lot of money. This guy had had a lot of money in his family because Cornelius Vanderbilt, being the railroad titan, had a whole lot of money. Now, how I got this picture is fairly interesting because I had to break the law in order to do so. So let me paint the picture for you. Let me set the scene, if you will, and then I'll go into a whole story about how I broke the law. So this house right here, this mansion, I shouldn't even call it a house. It's a mansion overlooks the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and so you have this lawn here, and at the end of this lawn down here are a bunch of trees, and then over those trees is the Atlantic Ocean. Now, between the trees and the Atlantic Oceans, there's a walkway. I was on that walkway and I saw this house. Being a history guy, I know how important this mansion is. So I wanted to take a picture. But the way they've set it up makes it impossible to take a picture from the walkway. First off, they put this big fence in the way. So it's really difficult to get over it. And then they planted a bunch of trees. So that way you can't just like poke over the fence. Like I'm pretty tall, so I can usually see over a fence and kind of take a picture. It's impossible to do so. I tried because I didn't want to uh, pay in order to go inside the fence. Now I am walking with three of my friends. Now three of my friends are, are, are all there. Um, um, if to, I guess to set the scene, um, two of them are girls. One of them's a guy uh, that might be important later because one of the girls is going to be mad at me in a little bit. So, um, we're, we're all walking along this path and I see this house and I say, I definitely want to go check that out. They see another house that's along the way, kind of in the same neighborhood, but same style, big mansion. 
And outside of that house is a shirtless man. He's in his 50s or 60s, and he's listening to like 80s rock. And they're like, oh, we want to go check that out. Okay, so we split up. I go check out the really cool house over here called The Breakers. They go look at shirtless guy listening to 80s music. So what I do is I follow this path. This path goes all the way around and leads to the front of the house. This is the back of the house here. So I'm on the opposite side of the house. Now, this house, as I pointed out, is surrounded by this massive fence. So it's almost impossible to get in except for this one little area. There's one little uh, gateway where you can actually go in. So as I'm walking up there, I'm starting to realize that I'm probably going to need to pay to get in i don't want to pay to get in because paying to get in doesn't get you into the house i, I could understand that you're going to pay me for it to walk inside the house to see everything paying to get inside the gate just lets you walk around the house which i think is absolutely ridiculous i mean i'm, I'm just walking on grass why should i have to pay you to walk on grass whatever and so I'm, I'm approaching there and I see a woman who clearly works there. She's got something on her shirt that says she, she works there. Um, and I try to kind of put my history teacher thing on um, because what I've noticed is that when I mention that I'm a high school history teacher, people tend to just give me stuff. They're like, oh, you teach high school? Kids are awful these days. You are clearly a saint for teaching high school. We'll just let you into this museum for free. And I'm, I've gotten very used to uh, having that privilege as a high school teacher. There's very few privileges I have as a high school teacher, but that is one of them. And I choose to exercise it often. And so I talk to her, I say, hey, by the way, I'm a high school history teacher and I really like to take a good picture of this house. You know, for my students, which is true. I do want to take a picture of this for you guys. I was already thinking about you before I even had you in my class. She's not buying any of it. She's like, yeah, well, tickets are over there and they're $15. And I look at her, I'm like, did I mention that I'm a high school history teacher? And she's still, none of it. She is not letting me in for free. So I start walking over to the ticket booth and then I, I realize something. And this is why you got to keep your eyes open because when you keep your eyes open and you observe things, you can find ways to kind of cheat the system a little bit. I noticed that the ticket booth is over there. And if the ticket booth is the ticket booth over there, it's very difficult for them to see me. So what they have is directly in front of me, right in front of the gate, is an old man who's supposed to make sure that you actually pay for the ticket and then see if you have a wristband on your hand. So that way he can allow you in. But I know how old guys act. You see, old guys aren't there because they really care about the house. Old guys are there because they're bored out of their mind because they've retired from their job and they want something to do. So they're just talking to anyone. And what they do is they stand there and they tell a really, really long story to anyone who's unfortunate enough to have to listen to it. And there's never any like educational value to it or like moral to it. And it's not like a funny story or anything like that. It's literally just a story. And that's, I've now realized that I'm doing the same exact thing. I'm just telling you a story. So I, already seen what my future is going to look like. So I see that the, the security guard there who's like in his 70s is talking to some unfortunate soul who has uh, been roped into whatever long story he's decided to tell. And so I put two and two together. I'm like, if that guy's not paying attention, then I can just kind of walk on in and do exactly what I need to do, which is take this picture. And so that's what I do. I don't run because if you start running, that's going to look suspicious and they're going to get you. So I just walk and I walk very confidently. It turns out that if you walk anywhere very confidently, people will just assume that you're supposed to be there. They're like, I don't know, that guy's really, really confident looking. So he's probably supposed to be doing whatever it is that he's doing. And then they just let you do that. And that's just a fact of life. So I walk through the gate very confidently. No one questions me. I walk around. I get to the back of the house, which is this side, and I start taking a whole lot of pictures. And I'm there for a while because I'm appreciating the history. I'm looking at the architecture. I'm taking good pictures. And all of a sudden, my phone rings and I pick it up. And it's one of my friends and she is calling me and says, where are you? I say, well, I'm, I'm at the breakers. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the house. She says, okay, you need to come out right now because I am hungry and I need food. Okay. Um, my response is, well, why don't you come on in? And she says, I can't come in. And I say, why? Why can't you come in? She says, there's some old man at the gate who says I need a wristband in order to come in. See, she's not as slick as I am. She doesn't observe things like I do. So she can't figure out how to get in there uh, without actually having, having to pay. And so I 
you know, because I'm the one who has the money. I got to go pay for lunch, things like that. I decide that I'm going to leave. But then I think I'm like, wait a second. If I go all the way around this house and back to the other side and go out the gate that I came in, that guy's definitely going to notice I don't have a wristband. And so I go to this side of the house and there's the fence over there. And so I jump over the fence. I get outside. I text her, hey, meet me on, on this street outside the fence. And we go over there. She starts screaming and yelling at me. She's like, how did you get in there for free? First off, how dare you accuse me of cheating the system and getting in there for free? I mean, that is what I did, but you don't know that I did that. That is so unfair to accuse me of that. And she looks me dead in the eye and says, I know you. I've known you for a long time. I know that you are too cheap to pay for that. And I confess, I'm like, yeah, you're absolutely right. I am too cheap to pay. I'm not going to pay $15 to go walk around the house. That's absolutely ridiculous. I'm not going to do that. There's no moral to the story. There, that, that's it. That's the entire story. We, we got lunch after. Um, I wish there was a moral or a lesson or something like that, but there's not. All I wanted to show you was that this house is really, really rich and really, really expensive. And this really showcases how much money these titans had. All of these guys I'm going over, Vanderbilt, um, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Henry Ford, this is the type of money they have. And when we get to our next lesson, we're going to see the type of houses that their workers live in. And then we're going to start to understand why some people had a problem with the Titans. Let's go ahead and move on. John D. Rockefeller. Um, John D. Rockefeller is the oil Titan, and he was the founder of Standard Oil. Now, Here's another story, so I'll put where you have to skip to in case you want to skip the story. Um, John D. Rockefeller had, he had a pretty rough childhood. First off, he grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, which that's unfortunate. Ohio is the 49th worst state uh, in, in the union. So that's uh, unfortunate for him. But it was rough, even, you know, including that. Um, his father was a traveling salesman. So what his father would do is he would sell these cure-alls. What these cure -all, this is actually how Coke and Pepsi got their start, is that these traveling salesmen would go around with these little bottles of, you know, pop or soda. Um, and they would say, hey, if you drink this, it will cure all of your problems. You have a stomachache? It will be cured. You have mental problems. It will be cured. And what actually happened was that those drinks had a bunch of cocaine in them. Um, I mean, there's a reason that Coke is called Coke. Um, and so people would drink them and they would feel great because of the cocaine, not because their disease or their illness was actually cured. Um, and then the traveling salesman would skip town. He would immediately get out before the effects wore off. And then, uh, you know, people were kind of stuck with um no cure to their illness while the traveling salesman had a whole lot of money. His father would routinely steal from little John D. Rockefeller. Little John would, uh, not the rapper, not the rapper, little John D. Rockefeller would um, oftentimes sell cookies or lemonade, you know, just like some kids do. And his father would steal the cash from him um, because that's just the type of man his father was. Well, John D. Rockefeller grows up um, and he, he gets older. He's in his mid 20s at, at this point and he's in church. He's a very devoutly religious individual. So he's in church and all of a sudden the earth starts shaking beneath his feet. The rafters are shaking, things are falling from them. And he is is very confused. He thinks that God has come back. He's like, God, are you here? I'd like to point out that if uh, if God had to visit a place in the world, it would not be Cleveland, Ohio. That would be actually the last place that God would ever visit. What's actually occurring is that outside of the church, there was a, a company that was drilling for oil. That's what was causing the earth to shake. And then they found some oil and that oil was spurting out of the ground. John D. Rockefeller, being the observant and intelligent individual that he is, starts to put two and two together. He says, this oil, this is going to be important. This is how I'm going to make a whole lot of money. But he's not going to drill for oil. That's a, that's a young man's game, and uh, drilling for oil is too risky. He's going to refine oil. He's going to take that oil, get rid of all the impurities, and make the best oil for you to light your home. That's why he calls his oil company the Standard Oil Company. You see, during this time period, oil companies um, obviously would sell oil, but this oil was dangerous. You literally light it on fire in order to um, brighten up your home. Well, if that thing tips over, all of a sudden, your entire home is on fire. And this happened... Not that frequently, but frequently enough where people were really worried about it. I mean, there were barns that would catch on fire and then all of a sudden it would be in the newspapers and everyone would be freaking out about oil. John D. Rockefeller says, well, see, my oil 
has standards. My oil doesn't burn your home. My oil only burns in order to give you some light and it is safe because it has standards, unlike all those other oils that have absolutely no standards. And so people start to buy oil from the standard oil company. Now, what John D. Rockefeller does is that he actually gains so much money, he starts buying out other oil companies. So he will go to a failing oil company and says, look, you guys are failing. You guys are going to be out of business. I will give you $5,000 right now. You just give me your entire, entire oil company. And yeah, they were definitely going to do that. That's a huge payday for some of the CEOs that are the owners of those oil companies. This is called horizontal integration. Horizontal integration is when you, a company, buy up all of your competitors. So John D. Rockefeller of Standard Oil buys up any other oil company who could possibly compete with him. That's what Monopoly is. If you've ever played the game Monopoly, Mono, One, Poly, everything, one person owns everything. I mean, that's the whole point of the game. And that's what Rockefeller has, except in real life. So instead of having orange $500 bills, he's got real green money and he has a whole lot of money. How much money does he have? It is estimated that due, you know, due to inflation, and they did all the math, that if John D. Rockefeller were alive today and had an island in which he was the only inhabitant of that island, he himself would be the 27th richest country in the world, a little bit ahead of Argentina and slightly behind Brazil. We're not talking this guy is rich compared to you and me. We're talking this guy is rich compared to other countries. And another, another comparison here, Jeff Bezos is worth about $150 billion. Rockefeller laughs at that. He was worth about $400 billion with a B dollars. This guy is really, really rich. In fact, he got so wealthy and so powerful that the government started to worry about him, where they actually had to, the government sued him because they were worried that he was going to have too much uh, social and political power. So it's the U.S. versus Standard Oil Company, and they forced him to break up his oil company into smaller oil companies. So all of these small oil companies or gas stations that we have, like ExxonMobil and Arco, at one point were all a part of the same thing. Now you might say, Mr. Cernak, why is all this important? Well, we are actually doing the same thing today. As I record this, Facebook and Google are being sued um, by the United States and also by uh, countries in the European Union because Google and Facebook have become so large and so powerful that other governments are actually worried about them having too much social and political control. So this idea of how big is too big is still something that's applicable to our society today and was applicable uh, 100 years ago with uh, John D. Rockefeller and the Standard Oil Company. Let's move on to Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie was the um, son of Scottish immigrants who uh, came to Pittsburgh. Now, when Carnegie came to Pittsburgh, he was just a, a little boy, and he was, once again, very intelligent and very observant as well, and also very hardworking, um, really the good prototype of a, uh, of a good American worker. Um, and what he did was that he used all that, he used in his intelligence and hard work and his observations in order to move up through society. And as he moved up, he gained more and more money, more and more power, and eventually created the Carnegie Steel Company, which produced steel for all the major cities. Now, at this time, steel was incredibly important. First off, railroads need steel. Second of all, big buildings in the major cities started to go up. You know, those skyscrapers that exist in Vegas and New York and every other major city in the world? Well, they are built using steel. If you can provide that steel, you can make a whole lot of money. And Carnegie was more than willing um, to do so. We have another story about Andrew Carnegie, so I'll, I'll put it in there so that way you can skip it in case you uh, just need to get through the notes very, very quickly. Now, Andrew Carnegie when he was very young, needed to build a bridge over the Mississippi River. He needed to connect East St. Louis in Illinois to St. Louis in Missouri. The problem with building over the Mississippi River is that the Mississippi River is a massive river with a rough current. If you build a wooden bridge, that wooden bridge is not gonna survive a day. That thing is going down and then you don't have a bridge anymore. And so Andrew Carnegie needs a way to build a steel bridge because steel is going to be able to withstand that. However, steel was incredibly expensive, that is, until this came along, the Bessemer process. Henry Bessemer came up with the Bessemer process, and 
yes, there's a lot of science to it. And if you're a science person, go ahead and look it up. But what we need to know is that it allowed steel to be made very cheap. So Andrew Carnegie uses this Bessemer process to start making cheap steel. He still has to go massively into debt. We're talking millions of dollars into debt to get all of this steel, get it over to Missouri and build the bridge over the Mississippi River. Now, once he's built this bridge, he needs the people to trust it. And the people don't trust it. After all, they, they're looking at this bridge with skepticism. Like, I don't trust that bridge. I'm not going over that bridge. Because that bridge is going to fall. I'm going to find myself in the Mississippi River and no telling what's going to happen. So Andrew Carnegie needs a way to convince them. Well, there's a tall tale at the time that an elephant will never step on something that is unstable. Never do so. Elephants are apparently incredibly wise and incredibly smart, and they know when something is stable, and they know when something is not stable. And so Carnegie needs to get an elephant. He gets one. I don't know how he gets one. He just found one. I have no idea. Maybe he went to the zoo. Maybe there was one just roaming around St. Louis. I have no idea. He gets an elephant and puts it on the bridge. And he makes a big PR spectacle. He's like, everyone, come and see the elephant. It's going to walk across the bridge. And you know, there's not too much going on in St. Louis and or, or East St. Louis either. So people go out there and they're looking at it and they're like, oh, is the elephant going to cross the bridge? And Andrew Carnegie kind of hits the elephant and the elephant starts crossing uh, across the bridge and everyone's holding their breath. They're like, oh, is it going to fall? Is, it gonna, is the elephant going to go in the river? Are we going to see the catastrophe of a lifetime? And the river, uh, the bridge does not collapse. The elephant does not fall into the river. He makes it all the way over the other side. And everyone says, that's it. That elephant is wise because he's an elephant. And we're going to cross that bridge too. And so they all cross that bridge. And uh, Andrew Carnegie becomes a household name and everyone loves him. So Carnegie uses that fame in order to build Carnegie Steel and make himself a the steel titan, eventually selling his company to J.P. Morgan, who we'll talk about in a second, for $480 million. Now, Car uh, Carnegie engaged in vertical integration. We said horizontal integration is where you buy out all your competitors and you're the only supplier for uh, that particular product. Vertical integration is when you own the entire process. So the steel process is a long, complicated process. You got to get the iron ore out of the mines. You got to ship it to the factories. The factories got to make the steel. Then it has to ship it out to the cities. And then there needs to be someone who actually uses that steel in order to build towers or railroads. What if you controlled all of that? Well, then you could have a monopoly on the steel business. And that's what Carnegie does. He owns the mines. He owns portions of the railroad. He owns the factories. He owns the builders as well. This is no joke. The exact same thing Jeff Bezos and Amazon do today. It's the same exact thing. Amazon used to be a place where I could produce something and then sell it to you. And Amazon was just there to kind of connect us together. But now Amazon produces their own products and they ship their own products and they own the website in which you buy the products. They're engaging in vertical integration. So all of this stuff that we're talking about with monopolies isn't something that's already been solved. That's something that was in the past. No, this is something that's uh, applicable to our time as well. We've already talked about the labor unions and we talked about the homestead strike that was against uh, Andrew Carnegie as well. As we're going to see in our next lesson, many people are going to be upset with Andrew Carnegie because he has a whole lot of money and a whole lot of wealth while other people do not. Let's go ahead and move on to our next one, which is J.P. Morgan. I don't really have a too funny or interesting story for J.P. Morgan. He's the merger titan. This guy was born rich, and he just became richer because what he did is he took small companies and merged them together. He believed that having a big company was the most efficient way to do things. After all, big companies who have a whole lot of money can actually use that money for good. For a real modern-day example, Pfizer. Pfizer is a big company that has a whole lot of money, and they created a COVID-19 vaccine faster than everyone else. So J.P. Morgan would say, that's a good thing. That's why we have big companies. Big companies are good. We're going to talk about maybe like the dark side of big companies in our next lesson when we look at um, what's underneath the goal. Now, he arranges for the merger of General Electric and AT&T. So these companies, both of those still exist today, um, and then eventually buys Carnegie Steel and renames it U.S. Steel. He also helps fund Thomas Edison. That's something people often forget. Yeah, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, um, and you, we can talk about Nikola Tesla another time. Um, but 
you also need a way to get lighting into all of the major cities. Thomas Edison de doesn't necessarily have the money to do that, so he needs a financial backer, and J.P. Morgan happens to step up and, and be that person. So he is, I'm, I would argue, just equally as important for putting lights in everyone's home as well. Our last one is Henry Ford. He's the automobile titan. Now, most people know Henry Ford as the inventor of the automobile. And yeah, that's true. But there were still automobiles there before Henry Ford came along. It's just that these automobiles were so expensive that only rich people could buy them. So it's more accurate to say that Henry Ford was the inventor of the affordable automobile. How do you make it affordable? He used the division of labor, the assembly line. You know, if you remember from our last lesson, the division of labor is when you just do one job. Don't put the whole car yourself. Just do one thing. Just put the wheel on, put the steering wheel in, put the engine. It's it, it makes it much more efficient and makes cars much more affordable for the people. He also started paying his workers five dollars a day. Part of it is because he's a benevolent individual. I'm a little biased because I'm from Detroit and so is Henry Ford. Um, but the other reason for it is that if his if his employees were given five dollars a day, then they would have enough money to buy cars, namely the Model T car. Um, and so we see that Henry Ford's going to make a whole lot of money using these programs and, and using the efficiency of the assembly line in order to get things done. And that's going to be the end of our lecture there. So, ladies and gentlemen, in our next lecture, we're going to be looking at, at what's underneath the gold. We're going to scratch away at this gold surface that we've already looked at with these railroad titans, and we'll look at um, what's going on with the common everyday people.